Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. And your word is love. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my Hi, and path. welcome to our Bible study Thy here at Bible Talk. Welcome to our table where each week we get together to remember that God's word is sweeter than honey to our taste. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So we're going to have some great food, spiritual food tonight. Feasting. Feasting on the word of God. Before we do, we're going to be starting, uh, continuing on in our study of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. Picking up in chapter 4, verse 13, where we left off last week. But before we do that, I'm going to ask my lovely wife, Alice, to start us off in a prayer to ask God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we bless you. We ask you to guide and direct Alan as he brings the word to us tonight. We ask that the Holy Spirit will fill him up with everything that we need to know for tonight. And we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word, which is nourishing to our whole body. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I was about to say that tonight may be a little unusual, but I think if you've ever been with us before, you know that unusual seems to be the usual at our Bible studies. Uh, and I remind you, if you are here for the first time, that our, that our purpose is to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, who is the Word, Word made flesh who dwelt among us. Um, we want to, we use this, study line by line, often word by word study in different books of the Bible, just as a kind of a launching point to take us wherever the Holy Spirit would lead us. Yes. So that's what we're going to be open to tonight as we look at life, mm. death, and eternity. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, as I said, we're going to start off, we left off, we were in, we just started verse 13 in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians last week talking about how God wants us to not be uninformed. But let me read that whole verse, all right? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. What I want to talk about tonight is an, an incredibly common subject in all of Paul's writings and his teachings and that is something that I, my perception is that we all will say we believe, um, but we don't act like it. That's true. And that's life, death, and eternity. Mm -hmm. So much of Paul's writing, to every church that he wrote to, to the individuals he wrote to, talks about the place of death. So here, in this verse, where he talks about he, he doesn't want us to be uninformed about those who are asleep. Well, his term is, those are, these are the people who have passed on. In the world's vernacular, these are the people who have died. And one of Paul's, the sustenance of Paul, the reason he had such victory and triumph in Christ Jesus, was he understood what life and death are all about, okay? So we're going to talk about that tonight, and what it's really going to be is a brief history of the world from beginning to end. Da -da -da. Let me see this in an hour. Okay. Before we do, I want to talk about some of the, the great wonders of the world, or places that are so famous in the world. All right? In Islam, in Medina, in Saudi Arabia, there is the Mosque of the Prophet, where Muhammad is buried. All right, the second holiest shrine in all of Islam. Massive. It's like, it's like, should be one of the wonders of the world where this place is built. I'm sure you've all seen another in Islam is the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. Right? The, yes. The Taj Mahal? I thought that was Hindu. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's Muslim. Oh. Yeah. And the Taj Mahal was built by the Emperor Shah Jahan for his favorite wife. It's a tomb. Right? Many people don't realize this in Catholicism, that the Vatican City is a tomb. Over 90 popes have been buried there. 
And in the beginning, they claimed, you know, that it was Peter who was buried there was one of the reasons that the site was chosen for it, because it was a tomb. In Egypt, outside Cairo, one of the truly one of the wonders of the world, you have the Great Pyramid of Cheops. It's a tomb. You hear a lot. As a matter of fact, Alice and I were in England this year, um, earlier this year, when in Westminster Abbey. Um, there was a royal wedding. Remember? Mm -hmm. Not not long ago, just a few months back. Well, what you may not know is that Westminster Abbey is a tomb. And that's where the royals are buried when they pass on. In American politics, I grew up in New York City. And in New York City, there is what used to be, you probably, most of you won't even catch this because of, uh, you've got to be old like me. Groucho Marx had a television show on, and one of his favorite questions when nobody could get any of the answers right was, who was buried in Grant's tomb? Because Grant, who was a general in the Civil War, and then became the 18th president of the United States, he indeed is buried in Grant's tomb in New York City, which is his famous monument. It's a tomb. In communism, in Moscow, and Red Square in Moscow is Lenin's tomb, one of the single most important places in the history of Moscow, see, it's a tomb. In China, one of the things that's almost a wonder of the world is the Terracotta Army. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of this by now. That's a tomb for the first emperor of China. It's a tomb. The three of us were in Israel a little earlier this year, and in Jerusalem they have the the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right. which we stumbled upon, which which I didn't stumble into under no circumstances. It's a tomb. It's a tomb that belongs to ridiculous, curious Christianity. I don't understand how it has any place in actual Christianity because it's the one place. You can talk about the rulers of the world. You can talk about the rulers of other religions. You can talk about the emperors of China and the emperors of... But in, in matter of fact, they were focused on death. Mm. I mean, the, the time, effort, energy, and money that went into building these tombs boggles the mind. The pyramids, for example, one of the wonders of the world. I mean, thousands of lives were spent building a tomb. Jesus had a tomb? Yeah. Watch me now. Briefly. And the thing about the tomb of Jesus Christ is it was occupied briefly. And when, after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, after the burial of Jesus Christ, the women went, mourning and weeping, they went there to anoint him. There was an angel present in that tomb. Well, you know, I have the verse here. It says, when these women, when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And the, as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? They didn't understand death. They didn't understand that death had been conquered. Most Christians today are still, their, their lives seem burdened by the prospect of death. Paul's choice of words here, is when he talks about those who are asleep, he is specifically saying they didn't die, they went to sleep. Jesus didn't have, you know, we, we tend to have great respect. You see funeral processions going through here in the United States, you know, long funeral processions with the cars with their lights on and police escorts taking them. I, I just want to read a verse to you, and I, I think that were this to happen today, this would upset a lot of people. It may have upset a lot of people 2,000 years ago. A disciple, another of the disciples came and said to him, to Jesus, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead 
to bury their own dead. That's Matthew 8, 21 and 22. He didn't have a high regard for death. Death is the province of Satan who comes to kill and destroy. All right? Before I go into my history of the world, I want to read one other verse. And this from Paul, writing to the Corinthians. But when the perishable, I'm perishable in my flesh. When the perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? We have to get to the place where we understand that death has been conquered. Death has no place. It's not like comforting people. Paul is not trying to comfort these people in Thessalonia by, by saying, oh, don't feel bad. Don't be. He's saying, there's no death taking place here. No death has taken place here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? See, even the disciples didn't understand this whole principle. Even after this, mm -hmm. right? Think of this. This is in the account in John chapter 11 of Lazarus. When Lazarus got sick and Lazarus died. All right? And Jesus got a report of this. So this he said, and after that he said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. John 11, 11 through 15. They didn't understand, why did Jesus say sleep if it's literally? Because we are composed of two distinct parts, the flesh and the spirit. No matter what you do, no matter how well you take care of your body, no matter how you choose to eat, no matter how you choose to exercise, no matter how much you choose, look at, you know what? You are carrying around a spirit renewed in flesh that is perishing. And that's the end of that story. All mankind has to hear this. And so much of Paul's teaching is about this, all right? But all mankind has to hear it because without understanding, all mankind seeks and struggles for eternal life in different ways. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, God, he has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, it says in Psalm 139. God put eternity, a knowledge that there is an eternity, a need for eternity, in the heart of every man. There is a, he also made a provision for that. But if you don't have a relationship with God, people will seek eternity in a, in a thousand different ways. This is one of the reasons why all oh, our future is our children. Hey, you know what? There'll be another generation of kids, there'll be another generation of kids, there'll be another, until Jesus comes back. Your future, Jesus, I mean, Paul is talking here about hope. Our hope, you hope for something in the future. You don't hope for what you have in the present, because, you know, if you have it, you don't hope for it, right? You only hope for something you don't no, have. No, you don't have. Mm -hmm. God has given us this hope, because he has set eternity on our heart, and he has made a way. All right. I'm going to try and do this, and I hope it all makes sense. I pray that the Holy Spirit just quicken this to all of us, including me. History of the world. Okay. I was quick. just going to quickly say that when you said that, that eternity has been set on our hearts, that's why people are always striving to live forever here. Right. Because they're, that, they're, that is right. that. Because they have a need for eternity. Exactly. Because we were designed for eternity. Exactly. God built us, created us, made us, formed us. Whatever he did with us, brought us into existence so that we would spend eternity with him. That, that's there. Right. Not and when we don't have it, then you're going to try and do something in the natural to, to preserve yourself. Exactly. It doesn't work. You can't do it. All right? Mm -hmm. 
So let's start. I'm, I'm going to break this into three parts because as Alice says, the answer is always three. Right? Mm -hmm. the, I'm going to talk first of all about the gift of life and then death. Okay, I'm going to just read you some scriptures. Number one, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Genesis 2 7. Right? God formed us and breathed life, gave the gift of life to Adam. Verse 2. Then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. That's Genesis 2 16 and 17. All right. So God gave man life, put him in a garden, and said you can eat from all these trees except for the one. And if you eat from that, the very day that you eat from that, you die. My third verse. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Genesis 3, 2, 4. Satan comes to bring death. The first thing he did here was to question the word of God. Call on the question. Saying, you know, God said this, but that's not, that's not the fact. That's not the truth. You can eat it and you won't die. So, verse, my fourth choice. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Genesis 3, 6. So, right? God said, don't eat from this. The devil said, it's all right to eat from it. They did eat from it. What, did God, what had God said? The day you eat from it, you will die. Therefore, the Lord God sent him, this is Adam, sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and with the flaming sword, which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Genesis 3, 23 and 24. So when Adam sinned that day, God kicked him out of the garden and blocked his entry back into it. Right? Genesis 4.1 says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. So the first human being that is born, bear in mind that Adam wasn't born, he was created. Eve wasn't born, she was taken out of Adam. So Cain is the first human born on the face of the earth. Right? He is conceived in sin. My seventh is, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Right. Here's where we need to take a, a look at what's going on. Like Jesus was talking to his disciples. God watches over his word to perform it. He said to Adam, the day you eat from this tree, you die. But Adam lived for hundreds and hundreds of years after he was kicked out of the garden. So is God's word wrong? No. Our understanding of death is what is wrong. Death is not your body flops to the ground and the heart stops beating. That's not what death is. Death is separation from God, who is life. Okay? Death is separation from God. It is not the cessation of the physical body. Because Adam was separated from God on the day that he committed the sin. But his body went on breathing for a long time. This is why Paul can talk about the sinners out there in the world who have refused to accept Jesus Christ until this point. They are walking as we were before we accepted Jesus, dead in our transgressions. 
Hollywood got this idea, writers got this idea, it all comes from the reality of spiritual truth. Zombies. There's all these movies about zombies. The Walking Dead. You want to know something? The zombies in real life are not, they don't have to be ugly. They're walking around without a spiritual relationship with God. So they are dead walking in their transgressions. Death is not about whether you are breathing or not. Death is about whether you are united with God or not. All right? So, that's death. Adam sinned, he died. He was separated from God. That's the creation and the death. Now, let's talk about the promise, the law, and the prophets. The Lord said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Genesis 22, 2. This is God speaking to Abraham, the father of our faith. Right? Genesis 22, 8 and 18 says, And Abraham said, he's talking to his son Isaac, he says, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then God said, In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Sin entered the world because Adam disobeyed. Right. Now, there is a restoration beginning because Abraham obeyed. The law. Leviticus 17, 11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by the reason of life that makes atonement. Atonement is the reparation for sin, the payment for sin. Okay? Now remember, it's going to start with Abraham, but Abraham doesn't do it. God reveals to him that he will provide the sacrifice for atonement. But there can't be a cure to death without the shedding of blood and sacrifice, right? In Isaiah, now get, get this, so you got this picture, all right? Mm -hmm. There was sin that brought death into the world. Death being not the body ceasing, but separation, separation from God. Mm -hmm. Now, God starts to make a promise and shows the rules to this promise in the law, and then speaks through the prophets. Isaiah 43, I'm going to read verse 1, 11, and 25. But now, thus says the Lord your Creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So now, God has shown, right? the promise he made through Abraham, then he establishes a law, the rules about how this has to be done, that there has to be a sacrifice with the shedding of blood, and then he says, I'm going to do it. I am going to read all of Isaiah 53. Because if you haven't heard this, you need to hear it. If you have heard it, you need to hear it again. All right? This is the prophet's. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. 
And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressions. That's Isaiah 53. So let me just keep this on track. In the beginning, you had God's creation, then you had the sin that led to death. Then you get the, you get the promise, you get the law and the prophets, where God lays out his plan to bring restoration. And the only way there can be restoration is for a sacrifice with the shedding of blood, and only God says that he will do it. We can't do it for ourselves, all right? That's the promise. Mm -hmm. Now, here in the third part, here is the redemption. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, Galatians 4.4. Now, Isaiah 53, that I just read, I'm sure you all recognize that. I pray that you all recognize that that's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And now the redemption happens when, in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ is born into the world. Right? That's the date. You want to mark the date on your calendar when Jesus was actually born. Find the one that says, in the fullness of time. My second verse here is from John chapter 1, verse 10 and 12. Speaking of Jesus, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were, who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believed in his name. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 So now, like I said, you see the problem, you see the promise and the prophecy and the rule, and now we're beginning to see the fulfillment of God's promise. Right? Thomas the Apostle was talking to Jesus in the midst of the disciples. This is in John 14, verses 5 and 6. And Thomas said to Jesus, to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So many Christians today seem to believe that if you're a good whatever, you're going to get there. You can't get there except through God's plan his Son, Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that God the Father provided to restore and redeem us. All right, I want to talk about the sacrifice one second. Because you see, it takes the sacrifice, going back to the law, the sacrifice for the atonement of sin that they had in the law as a foreshadowing of the truth, right, was an unblemished lamb. An unblemished lamb was taken by the high priest and sacrificed to obtain the blood. The blood was taken and sprinkled on the mercy seat for the atonement of sin, right? 
That had to be an unblemished lamb. Yes. We're blemished. We were born into the world like Cain sin. was. After our own kind. The sin of Adam. You can look at this any way you want, but this is the Word of God. It's called typically original sin. And that sin has been passed on from every generation of man since Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain. This is the sins of the father. Of the but this is forever, son. right? Yeah. This is forever. It's carried on because each generation gives birth after its own kind. Okay. So, none of us can fulfill this because we're all blemished with a stain of sin. But Jesus was not. But he had to be put to the test. The same way before the Passover, they, the, the religious leaders, they would test the lamb to make sure that it met the requirement of being unblemished. Mm -hmm. I want to read you this. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This isn't the week that Christ went into Jerusalem that ended in his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. The Father tested Jesus and found that he was well pleased. In that same week before his death, the Pharisees continually tested Jesus. And Matthew 22 says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And then a couple of verses later, after Jesus answered that, it says, After he answered, no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on ask him another question. Matthew 22 because they could find no fault in Jesus. They may have hated him, mm -hmm. they may have called for his crucifixion, but they could not find any fault in no him. Blemish. No blemish. So now you have the Father, and you have the religious leaders who have tested Jesus and found no fault. Mm -hmm. But there's one left, the world. Jesus is put on trial before Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. Pontius Pilate literally represents all of the world's power. He is Caesar's man in the territory, all right? He is the representative of Caesar. He represents all of the power of the world. So Pilate puts Jesus on trial for his life and tested Jesus. This is what's written. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you're a king? And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world, to testify the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. A chapter later in the Gospel of John, Pilate says, So he then handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. John 19, verses 16 to 18. Everybody tested Jesus and found no guilt in him, and then said, crucify him. Who was he crucified for? takes away the sins of the world. He took away my sins. He took away your sins. He took away your sins. He was crucified to pay the price for our sins. He had none of his own. He who knew no sin became sin for our sake. So that is the fulfillment, right? That brings about the restoration the gift of life. The angel said to the women, remember, mm -hmm. do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. That's Matthew 28, 5 and 6. In other words, he's saying, you know, don't be afraid. He's not here. There's no death here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? There is no death here in this place. And I'll read what Paul said again. 
O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, 57. Death has been conquered. Death has no power over us. If you make the right choice. Because you see, here, in the restoration, it's a gift, but you have to receive the gift. So, go back to the rules. And in the rules, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. So the rules say, yes, God did what he had to do. He obeyed the rules. He made the sacrifice of himself. He, he paid the price for our sins. But you have to reach out and accept that gift. He has set the gift of life before you. He has set the gift of blessing before you. But you have to choose it. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, what does that boil down to? Well, um, there's another verse that most of you must know from John 3, verses 1 through 3. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, mm -hmm. a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to make this choice. The choice is to receive the free gift. Ephesians 2.8, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. To the Romans he wrote, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 Okay? Mm -hmm. There was the problem. This is the history of the world. Yes. This is the history of the world. If you think anything else is important, you don't get it. Because eternity... David says that our life is like a breath. I mean, we don't have, a, we don't have an eternal perspective because we have become so focused on the world and the things of the world. It's like, you know, it, to compare a lifetime, David says it's like a, like a breath. It just, in the terms of eternity, it's not even measurable. It's not even measurable. We need to understand that God has given us this eternal life that we have to, to reach out. But if you're born again, you can be able to say with Paul, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Every believer can say this. Every believer who has accepted that free gift, that restoration, every believer who has accepted the life that was sacrificed by Jesus that we might have life, can say, should say, we have died, and our life is hidden in Christ Jesus. We have to die. Okay? Got that? Do you agree that when you accept Jesus Christ, you have died, you've been born again, yes. born from above? We are new creations in Christ Jesus, Paul says. We're not the old guy with new clothes, clean clothes on. We're not the old sinful person, just cleaned up a little bit. We are a new creation. This is what the Word of God says. We're a new creation because the old one died. It's not about the body, it's about the spirit. The you know, I'm wearing a shirt. I don't want to get the sex rated, so I'm not going to take my shirt off. But if I took my shirt off and threw the shirt over there somewhere, I'd still be me. Mm -hmm. I'm not my shirt. Yeah. Want to know something? I'm not my body either. That's right. I am the spirit of me that dwells within this body. That's the gift of life that I have from God. All right? So if you die, think of this verse. This is Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, it's appointed to man to die once. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, those of you out there who believe in reincarnation, mm -hmm. 
what a sad hope to have that you're going to come back again and you're not going to come back as a cow or a frog or something, whatever it is. And it's not about karma. No, no, it's not. Karma is not a God. Karma doesn't destiny or create your, the destiny of your life. It's the choices you make to accept or reject, to obey or disobey the voice, the word of God. The creator. The creator of you. Yes. All right? But it's appointed the man to die once, not multiple times. You don't die and come back, die and come back. Most pagan religions are secular or circular. circular. All right? Mm -hmm. They go round and round and come back. Our religion, our faith, is it has a beginning point and it has an end point. That's what Paul is talking about here in his letter to the church of the Thessalonians, about how the hope we have is Christ returning with those who have fallen asleep, right? That's why they're so dizzy. But if you've died, okay, listen, this is the word of God. Do you believe it? Yes. You do? Yes. Do you? Do you? <laughs> well, if you've died once, and it's a point, if you've died because you accepted Jesus Christ, and it's appointed to man to die once, guess what? There's none left. You can't die twice. If you have, see, this is what we get into, the, and this is what I'm saying, what I see in practice is people saying they believe the Word of God, but in reality, they walk around not living like they believe the Word of God. If you believe that you died and your life is hidden in Christ Jesus, you're a new creation, and you believe what the Word of God says, that it's appointed to man to only die once. You've been born again. You are a new creation. You can never die again. Period. And this is me just for one more verse, and then you can talk. That's why Jesus said to Martha, John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he said to Martha, do you believe this? Okay, what do you want to say? I was going to say that when you're born again, um, when you die and you're born again, you're a new creation, there should be a sense of newness. There should be a sense of different. I mean, you, you actually should sense something different going on in your life. Well, you're a new creation. Yes. If, well, you're not ex if you don't experience that, or if you haven't experienced that when you're born again, then you might want to rethink that or go back and do it over again. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, no, yeah, well I, I, I don't know about doing it over again. Well, you know, the, Maybe you didn't do it the first time exactly, you received yourself. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But the thing is, when you are born again, you're given life. Yes. You're given power. Yes. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? You become a temple of the Holy Spirit. You now have power that you didn't have right. before. Exactly. That power is the ability to lead and live a new lifestyle. If you have a new life, you should have a new lifestyle. Um, the, the fact of the matter, this is what, but you know, it's it's a process that we have to go through. I don't know that it should be a process, but it is. That's why Paul wrote to the church at Rome and said, you know, we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So there is this constant thing. This is why we're having Bible studies. Mm -hmm. You know, we ended last week by talking about the fact God has given his revelation. Yes. All right? God has revealed from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. God has revealed. He revealed the problem. Mm -hmm. He revealed his forecast for the solution. Yes. And then he revealed the solution. Mm -hmm. The only revelation we have to look forward to now is Christ as he returns. What we need is understanding. And while we've had the revelation, and we, understand, we, we can see the Word, we can read the Word, the question is, are we living the fullness of the Word? Because most Christians are overwhelmed by the fear of death. Yes. Yeah. And Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. We should be living this victorious life, because the only thing, the world has nothing that it can do to you. Oh, you say, well, it can hurt you. You know what? All things work together for good. We consider it all joy when we encounter various trials. We're exalted in our tribulations. What do you want me to say to you? We're going to talk about this sometime here in Paul's first letter to the Thess to the Thessalonians. 
when he talks about God's will, I've had so many people come to me, oh, I'm seeking God's will. I want to know what God wants me to do in my life. I want to know God's will. I'll tell you God's will. It says in the fifth chapter of this letter, he says, mm -hmm. God's will is that you give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. You, got, you know, you've got to walk in the victory that Christ has purchased for you, in the new life that Christ has purchased for you. You are a new creation. You've got to start walking and living like that new creation. We, uh, we should have no fear of death. You know, here, let me go back. Uh, let me read that whole verse again, right? Verse 13, chapter 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. He's talking about those who others would say have died. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Who's the rest? The unsaved, the unbelievers. They have no hope. They have no hope. Their hope is a false wish. It's just a fantasy. Oh, I hope I get a new job. Oh, I hope I get a better. You know what? The hope we have is an assurance. It is the anchor of our souls, as it says in Hebrews. And it is what, what uh, it says in Hebrews also is our faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, not seen. How do we know that? I, I get nuts when I hear all these people talk about, oh, is there a life after death? Is there a life? I've talked to Jesus. <laughs> if you don't know, if, I'm not going to say if you believe, this isn't a matter of belief, if you don't know that there is life after death, you've never met Jesus Christ. You've never encountered Jesus Christ. What's wrong with you? Are you saved? Or are you just playing church? Every Listen, I want to go about those who grieve. Do you understand? We're not supposed to grieve. No, no. This is hard. This is hard. This is Jesus saying to his disciples, let the dead bury the dead. I know that there is sorrow in separation. I know. I mean, you know, I've had, I've, I've had, I've had friends and family who have gone on. There is pain in separation. But this grieving is a deep sorrow. We're supposed to have this joy knowing that they have gone to be someplace better than here. Do we believe that there is a place better than here? Last week I said that what I see in the church is the more that there's prosperity preaching, a focus on the world here and now, the less desire there is for Jesus to come back. The less focus there is on that promise, that hope we have of what Paul is talking about here is the return of Jesus Christ with those who have gone on before. That's the hope. Where do we get this peace? I, I see a church, I see people, of, the people of God, so without this fear. peace. You know, talk about living in fear. We live in fearful times. Yes. If you not have that relationship with Jesus Christ, where you have the power to obey his command, not suggesting, when he said, be anxious for nothing. We live in times when the economy is not sound. When peace is not sound. I mean, there are wars and rumors of wars all around us. There is poverty all around us, even in, yes, here in the United States of America. There is gang warfare all over the United States of America. There is no security in anything. You know, but people, I'll go into a store, and I'll have a clerk say to me, how are you? And I'll say, I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm not going to say, oh, I feel good today. I'm not going to say, oh, you know, I'm tired. I'm the fact of the matter is, if you ask me how I am, I'm going to tell you I'm safe. Right. Safe and secure from all alarm. I have peace because I am in the palm of it where no man can snatch me out. I'm in the, in the shelter of the Most High, in the shadow of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, that is the place to be. Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe. By the way, get upset with the people who only give you half this verse. <laughs> let not your heart be troubled. Because if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you, you have good reason to be troubled. You have excellent reason to be troubled. But he said, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus said, I give you my peace, I leave with you. Not as the world gives, do I give. You know what the world gives? The tombs of the Egyptians, the tombs of the Chinese, the tombs of the Muslims, the tombs, the tombs, the tombs, death. They have a focus on death. I got a focus on life because his name is Jesus Christ and I know him well. Where is that sense of conquest that we have? Because Christ 
raised from the dead by the power of God the Father. God the Father called him forth from that tomb. That tomb could not hold him. And because that tomb cannot hold him, death has been conquered. Death has no victory in my life, I'm going to tell you. Hallelujah. Every, every Christian funeral, since we seem a need to have them, should be a celebration of what Christ has done. And I, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but quite frankly, I don't care an awful lot. I don't know why we put the bodies on display. No, it's like, you no. Know, why is there a church as a sepulcher? Why? When, when, the, when God sent the angels to be in a tomb and say, what are you doing here? Why didn't he send angels to the, to the church of the Holy Sepulchre? And there should be angels at the gate, not, not tourist guides. And they said, they, every, every person going in there, the angels should say, what in the world are you doing here? It's because they're still wrapped in the they're death still, they, rags. they still got a mind that comes from Egypt. And the they still have un, uh, unbelief because John and P Peter didn't believe the report of the woman. And they had to go to the tomb to see it empty. So what are we doing? We're still doing the same thing. But there's no reason for us to be doing the same thing. No. Because this is why I'm saying, if you examine the Word of God, you will find that Paul spent an incredible amount of time talking about this very subject. Mm -hmm. Talking about how death has been conquered. Hey, you know, one of the things I, I said before, death is separation from God. But in one of the most beautiful passages of all Scripture, in Romans chapter 8, mm -hmm. Paul talks about how nothing can separate him from the love of God. And the, one of the first things he mentions is death can't separate him from the love of God. Because death is separation from, the, from God. Right. Yes, I understand that if somebody you love has gone on, and this is what Paul is writing, there's pain and there's sorrow. There's sorrow of that temporary loss. The more you understand that it is temporary, the more your your loss or suffering from loss will be pain subsides. Sub absolutely, absolutely. And why shouldn't it be? Absolutely. We should be rejoicing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, these are these are. Listen, this is the word of God. You can get upset with me, but I, I'll give you Paul's email at the end of the study. Here. <laughs> Write to him, because he's the one that said. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Death is not something to be feared. Death is something to be, you know, that's the end of the race. It's something to be looked forward to, except for the fact we got a job to do here. And because we have a job to do here, we're not going to go rushing off and jump off a cliff so we can get to heaven. And I don't suggest that. Right? God, God tells us our, ha our habitations and our boundaries. And one of those is the length that we're here on earth. That's we right. have a yes. purpose here, that's otherwise right. you'd take us. There's an appointed time for everything. I, I, when your dad died, there were two attitudes, one yours and one of the other person's. Church. You, you might want to tell that story uh, real I'll, quick. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it real quick. Uh, Alice and I, we had not been saved for a very, very long time. Uh, and my my father, uh, who was a kind of a staunch Roman Catholic at the time, as we had been raised Catholic, mm -hmm. got concerned when I got saved and went it off to pray, and it, 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 it changed my life drastically and completely in a, in, a, in an instant. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I had owned a business, and I got rid of the business and went off to pray to seek God about the ministry that He was calling me to. And my father literally thought that I'd gone bonkers. He thought I'd gone crazy to do such a thing. And he was living in Florida. We were living in New York. And he, he literally came up to New York to spend a week with us to try and find out what was going on with me, you know, maybe send me off to the funny farm, whatever he thought was necessary. And when he came up for a week, he stayed with us. And we were very, very busy. I mean, we were literally going day and night in ministry. And he said to me, you know, you can't do this. And we couldn't come to an agreement on this, on this spiritual uh, conversation. And at the end of it, I said, to, I said to my father, you know, you're not getting any younger. He was actually younger than I am right now. Uh, and I said, you know, what, what happens to you when you die? We have to face this. That's right. We should, we, be, we, we, 
shouldn't be afraid of talking about or facing death. So I said to him, what happens when you die? And he said, I don't know. So he went back down to Florida, and every week I would call him from New York, and we'd spend a little time on the phone, and every week I would share a little with him about what God was doing in our lives and about the love of the Lord. And one night I called him up, it was a Wednesday night, and I called him, and we were talking, and in the middle of this he said to me, Butch, that's what he called me, he said, Butch, I said, I want what you have. I want that peace, I want that joy, I want that life. So he and I prayed over the phone for him to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And uh, I, I said to him, I love you, Dad. Now, you know what? I always loved my father, but I wasn't given to saying that out loud. Right? Just not part of our yeah, culture, yeah, right? And he said to me, just prior to hanging up, he said, well, praise the Lord. So that gave me great joy. The next night, Alice and I were at a prayer meeting, a couple hundred people. And in the middle of the prayer meeting, I got a telephone call, and it was my aunt. And she had just gotten word that my father passed away unexpectedly that night. Mm -hmm. So I went back from the phone conversation, I went back into the prayer meeting, and I told everybody, I, I, I kind of stopped the prayer meeting and shared with them, that I just gotten word that my father died. My father died. My father went to sleep. Went to sleep. <laughs> and of course, 200 people there went, oh. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I said, what? don't go, whoa. I said, you know, my father, he got saved in Pao Zoom. King, he's straight into the throne room of God. It's like, well, how did he, how does he get this treatment? And I'm still here. 35 years later, I'm still here working this out. You know, and he went Pao Zoom straight on the express. But just think of it. What's the last thing you said to him? The last thing I said to him was, I love you. The last thing he said to me was, praise yes, the Lord. Lord. You know what? I, I am looking forward to, to being him. with him again. Yeah. Because I have an assurance, I have a blessed assurance. Well, you know, I, I may see him before I go, because he could be coming back with Jesus before it's time for me to go. But the fact of the matter is, here's what I know, and I know this with the fullness of everything in my being. My father is not dead. He was buried, I guess, about 34, 33 years ago, somewhere around here. And, you know, this can upset you or not upset you. I haven't been to that grave where he was buried once in 33, 34 years. There's nothing there for me to see. Do I miss him? Yeah, actually, I, I do. And funny, the, the older I get, probably the more I miss him because the more I realize that, you know what, he was actually right when he was telling me all this stuff. Yeah. There's a lot he's of lies. Fun. Except yeah. about one thing. No, you I mean, were right. But he, come, he gets smarter and smarter by the, as the days go by. So, yeah, I, I miss him. But I'm not grieving. No. I'm rejoicing yes. knowing we'll see him that he's asleep, That's not right. dead. Because Christ is the resurrection. Oh, yeah. So, um, either we know this or we don't know this. The, the problem is, I see in our culture, you know, it's one thing for me to look at the, the pyramids and see an Egyptian culture that goes back a long, long way, where they were so focused. You know what their holy book was? The, the Book of the Day. I have a book of life. I can understand other faiths. I can understand Hindus, or, you know, thinking they go around and around and around. Maybe they'll come back as a frog next time or because they're wrong. And I say, well, I don't hate them for that. I, I want to share the word of God with them so they will know that they don't have they can have hope. They can have hope for something greater. To come back having put off the perishable and put on the imperishable. They can come back and go and enter in to a relationship with God the Father, being born again. They can die once and never ever ever again. So I look at this, but I don't understand it with the church. I don't understand a church that doesn't have that hope. Doesn't, it doesn't show the hope doesn't show to the, the unsaved, no. to, to okay. the people that have no hope. Yeah. How can you show somebody something okay. that you let can't me, see yeah, yourself? We're running out of time, so let me, let me end on this verse. Right? I talked about this. This is from Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 3. This is what Jesus read when he went into the synagogue to start his ministry. 
The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland, a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. God doesn't want you to mourn. He wants you to rejoice because he has conquered death. I pray that this would be a week when you live the fullness of life that Jesus Christ purchased for you so dearly on that cross at Calvary. So is a comfort to my soul Your word is the truth that sets me free Your word is a light into my path Your word is a lamp into my 